All right, welcome back to ABA exam review. Today we're going through our next set of BCBA exam practice questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, check out behavioranalyststudy.com. We have practice exam, study guides, and of course our famous combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. As always, work hard, study hard, get to our questions. Question one. A research team is analyzing the effect of a tangible reinforcement on a student's ability to read multiple sentences in a book without looking up in the classroom. Three students are involved, and all three students look up whenever the door to the classroom opens. The door opening is most likely a what in this scenario. All right, when we're thinking about variables in an experimental scenario, consider the independent variable, dependent variable, extraneous variables, and the confounding variables. Now, the independent variable, of course, is the thing we're manipulating. The dependent variable is affected by the independent variable. Our extraneous variables are all the hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of other variables in the environment that we have to attempt to control for. And it's unrealistic to think that we can control for all these variables. And sometimes those variables affect the dependent variable and they become confounds. So in this case, we are looking to analyze students reading multiple sentences in a book without looking up in the classroom. However, when the door opens, they look up anyway, which isn't part of our experiment. The looking up as a result of the door opening is now confounding the experiment. Okay, It's creating chaos in the experiment. So it's confusing the experiment. So what are we looking at? The door opening is most likely a what? It's not our independent variable because we are not manipulating that. Okay, we're not looking at the effects of the door opening. We're looking at the effects of a tangible reinforcer. It isn't our dependent variable. Dependent variable is looking up in the classroom. It's a confounding variable. It's confusing the scenario. And it isn't a threat to external validity because external validity is all about generalization. Here we're talking about internal validity. So the door opening is most likely a confound in this scenario. Giada cut up the vegetables to roast in the oven. She set the oven temperature and then put a timer on for one hour. The timer went off when she was upstairs, and by the time she got to the oven, the vegetables were burned. What needs to change regarding Giada's behavior so the vegetables do not burn? All right, well, we need to change something about Giada's behavior in relation to the vegetables not burning. And all these behavior questions be very clear about whose behavior you're looking at and what is it in relation to. In this case, we know Giada set the oven, put it on for an hour, and then when she got back to the oven, vegetables were burnt. So she didn't get there quick enough, right? She wasn't able to get to the vegetables before they burned. So we need to change something about the behavior to prevent that. A, if we increase her into response time. Well, we're not really dealing with into response time here, right? Because we're not looking at the time in between taking the vegetables out of the oven, right? Because once the vegetables are burned, they're burned. They're either burned or they're not, right? We're not too worried about the time in between the next time she cooks vegetables. So inter response time isn't necessarily relevant here. What about increasing her duration? Now, if you were to say we need to decrease her duration, that it the duration it takes to get to the vegetables, maybe. But nowhere do we need to increase Giada's duration or the duration of her behavior. That's not going to help us fix the issue of the vegetables burning. What about decreasing her latency? Well, if we consider the timer, the SD, if we decrease the latency, the time it takes for her to respond to the timer, then maybe we can get her to get to the vegetables quicker and prevent them from burning. So decreasing her latency actually might be plausible. We don't want to increase her latency because then she's going to move even slower when the timer goes off. We want her to start moving as quickly as possible when this timer goes off, because that is going to reduce the chances of the vegetables burning because she might get to the vegetables quicker. So what do we need to change in order to prevent the vegetables from burning? We're not worried about inter response time. We're not going to increase duration. We want to decrease the latency from the time in between the SD, which is the timer, to her starting to respond and going to get the vegetables. So our answer here is C, decrease her latency. A behavior analyst is supervising a new client for the first time after just meeting them. After only 10 minutes, the behavior analyst states that the function of the behavior is automatic. Do you see any issues with this approach? 
This is a big problem with newer behavior analysts and even seasoned behavior analysts. They are too quick to attribute behavior to automatic function, meaning automatic reinforcement is maintaining it. And that's a big error we make because once we say something is automatic, that's implying it's internal, right? For the most part, it's an internal sensation. It feels good. It's sensory, however you want to say it. And a lot of times it prevents us from looking at all the other variables outside that could be affecting the behavior. So this behavior analyst, the first time they met them, after only 10 minutes, says, well, the function must be automatic. Do you see issues with this? A, no, as long as the behavior analyst felt that automatic was the function. Well, whenever going by feel, okay, don't pick this answer. We we don't, it doesn't matter how we feel, right? It matters what the, the assessment shows. What does the data say, right? So it's not about feel. It's about what we are actually seeing and measuring. B, there is no information indicating the behavior analyst did anything wrong. Well, possibly they, they, they were very quick to say the function of the behavior is automatic. C, yes, stating automatic reinforcement as the, as the function this quickly could limit further analysis. Yeah, this is the big problem when we are too quick to say something has an automatic function. We stop analyzing other variables and are trying to determine what is that internal thing maintaining it, right? So we don't want to be too quick to apply the automatic function to behavior. And then D, yes, the behavior cannot be automatic. Well, it, sh it could. We don't know anything about the behavior, really, so we can't say D for sure. What we do know is they attributed it very quickly, in only 10 minutes, behavior to an automatic function, and stating automatic reinforcement this quickly could limit further analysis. A family is walking through the mall. They stop at the ice cream shop to look at the different flavors of ice cream. The ice cream shop only serves ice cream and milkshakes. One of the children says pizza while inside the shop. What type of verbal operant does this most likely represent? Now, in order to figure this question out, you need to understand what evokes different verbal operants. Remember, for the exam, you want to know what evokes, what reinforces, is there formal similarity, and is there point-to-point -point correspondence? Those are the four characteristics of verbal operants you want to know. In this case, we want to know what is evoking this person saying pizza. They're at an ice cream shop, which only has ice cream and milkshakes, and yet they say pizza. So A, tact doesn't make much sense. There's no pizza in this ice cream shop as far as the question is concerned. And tact is evoked by a nonverbal SD, so it can't be tact. What about B, echoic? Well, nowhere in the question does it say anyone said pizza. And echoic is evoked by a verbal SD, right, with point-to-point -point and formal similarity. No one said pizza, only the child did. C, manned. Well, man could make sense because a man is evoked by a motivating operation. Maybe the child is in the ice cream shop but really wants pizza, so they say pizza. Man makes more sense given the information. And then D, textual makes no sense at all in the context of what the question is giving us, right? So based on the information we have, man makes the most sense. Okay, They're not labeling anything. They're not echoing anything. All they're doing is saying pizza, which we have to assume based on our information is based is, is evoked by a motivating operation. And the verbal operant evoked by a motivating operation, of course, is a C mand. An extinction plan is developed for a screaming behavior. The mother of the learner implements extinction as planned for one week. However, on the eighth day, the mother gives in and provides reinforcement for screaming. What should the behavior analyst do? All right, common scenario. You've developed a plan. The plan is working, it's being implemented, and then one day, implementer messes up, right? In this case, the mother. What do you do as a behavior analyst in this situation? A, conduct a brand new functional behavior assessment on screaming. Is it necessary to complete a brand new assessment on screaming for one day where the plan wasn't implemented correctly? No, not much has probably changed over the screaming behavior, right? We want behavior to be repeatable, and one day out of the eight, is not enough to call for a new FBA. Similarly, B, conduct a new functional analysis for screaming, is very unlikely the function changed. And if you've already implemented an extinction procedure, then you should know what the function is, right? So conducting new assessments doesn't seem necessary quite yet. C, encourage the mother to stick to the original plan and find out what can maintain implementation. Good. For a week, the mother was able to implement the plan. 
So you need to figure out how can I maintain the mom's behavior of implementing that plan? Because she was able to do it for a week. So you encourage her to go back to the plan. Remember, when, when we do something incorrectly, we try to stick to the plan and stick with what works. And then we have to figure out, all right, what can we do to maintain the mother's ability to implement that plan? And then D, threaten to suspend services if the mother does not follow through with the plan. That is way too harsh, okay? Before you even ever get to that point, you need to sit down and talk to the mom about what's going on. It's possible the mom just had a tough day, okay? She did it for seven days. She had one bad day. We just need to revert back to the plan and figure out what can we do now to maintain the mother's implementation. We have to kind of use ABA on her as well. So what should the behavior analyst do? Well, encourage the mother to stick to the original plan and find out what can maintain implementation. Greg runs three miles every morning. He has done this for the past three weeks. You could consider the running behavior what? All right, kind of a, a different question, right? Kind of a um, fluency question almost. So we're looking at Greg. He runs three miles every morning, and he's done it for pat the past three weeks. What are we going to consider this? A, steady state responding. Steady state responding simply says responses occur over and over again without any sort of significant change in their measurement, right? In this case, we're measuring the three miles, doing it all the time. This is very steady, okay? B, baseline logic. Well, steady state responding leads to baseline logic and is an assistant baseline logic, but Greg running the, beha the behavior is not the baseline logic part, right? C, steady state strategy, again, is a way to achieve steady state responding, but we're already at steady state responding. So it's not the strategy. We are already experiencing steady state responding. And then D, practice effect. Practice effect occurs as intervention goes on, and the participants learn as intervention goes on, right? So, for example, if we're doing a math intervention, we're trying to teach addition, slowly but surely, practice effect might take over. Okay, just repeated practice. They might learn and learn and learn. Now what's happening here, right? All we know is Greg runs the same amount of miles every morning for three weeks. He's got a very steady state of responding. A generalized condition reinforcer is primarily characterized by which, by which of the following items? GCRs are sometimes misunderstood, okay? Um, GCRs are reinforcers that have been paired with condition and unconditioned reinforcers and don't rely on any sort of establishing operations to have effect, okay? So they're useful if we can't really manipulate EOs. So the question wants to know which one of these characterizes generalized condition reinforcers. A, it is a tangible thing that can be held or touched. Well, not necessarily. Praise can be a, a generalized condition reinforcer. So A, doesn't fit. B, it must be paired with food or water in order to attain GCR properties. Again, not necessarily. It doesn't have to be food or water. It can be other reinforcers. C, it does not depend on a current establishing operation to be effective. Good. We, we don't need a current EO to be in place for a GCR to have reinforcing properties, which makes them so valuable, right? Praise can be used in a variety of situations, even if the EO isn't there, as long as praise functions as a reinforcer, obviously. And then D, obtains its reinforcing properties only from other conditioned reinforcers. Well, not true. It obtains it from conditioned and unconditioned reinforcers. So a generalized conditioned reinforcer is primarily characterized by which of the following items? C, it does not depend on a current establishing operation to be effective. And then finally, what part of a stimulus generalization gradient indicates the degree of generalization? A gradient is just a visualization of how generalization is occurring. Okay. So again, this is more of an awareness question, right? We're practicing. So we want to be aware of as much as possible regarding our field. So what part of the gradient indicates the degree of generalization? Is it level, trend, slope, or variability? Well, the answer is slope. The steeper the slope, the more generalization. If the slope is relatively flat, generalization might be lacking. So this is kind of a rote thing, right? But it's good to be aware. What part of a stimulus generalization gradient indicates degree of generalization? C, slope. Great. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass, let us know. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.